Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm James Shore. Every week we choose a software development technique or skill, come up with a challenge related to that skill, and solve it live on stream. And this week we're finishing up our Microservices Without Mocks series. Uh, specifically, what we're going to be looking at is the router and using a technique that some people sort of jokingly call code whispering. So uh, we're going to get started on that in just a moment. Uh, Jitter Ted, welcome. Thank you very much for bringing your channel along. Welcome, everybody. This is Tuesday Lunch and Learn, and today we are looking at microservices without mocks, part four. We're doing routing and a technique called code whispering. If you'd like to follow along with the code, uh, check out the code from GitHub, github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Check out this tag here, 2020-06-23. All right, let's get to it. Got a lot of ground to cover. So this is Microservices Without Mocks. It's part four in previous episodes, which you can find right down here, jamesshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn. Uh, we set up all of our infrastructure. We set up our server, the ability to start and stop it, the ability to take requests, the ability to, to do responses. What we didn't do is any actual routing. We didn't check the URL or the content type or the method. That's what we're gonna do this week. And in addition, we're doing this all very thoroughly tested, but we're doing it without mocks. Uh, and the reason for that is that mocks are a great way of creating solitary tests. They can check a unit in isolation and they can even check, they can even check that it calls its dependencies in a particular way, whatever way is hard coded into the test. What it cannot do is check that that dependency works the way the test says it does. And over time, I guarantee you, the behavior of your dependencies will change. It's just absolutely, if your code is being maintained in any way whatsoever, the behavior of your dependencies will change over time. And when that happens, the code that depends on them will break. But if your tests don't check that your code uses the dependencies correctly, your tests will continue to pass because the tests just say, are you calling a dependency in this way? It doesn't know if that's right or not. And when it does that, your code is broken, but your tests are all passing. That's not a great place to be in. So the typical way to solve this is to write integration tests. These are slow and they're brittle and you're basically writing your tests twice. That's not fun. So what I've been showing you, and again, if you want to see this, jameshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn, uh, look for the testing without mocks episode. It goes into all the details. What we're doing though is sociable testing. That is a test that is still a unit test that checks that it calls its dependencies correctly, that the behavior that you expect out of your unit is still the behavior it's supposed to be, even when the dependencies are in the picture. So that's why we're doing this without mocks. Now our challenge for today is to do this uh, for the routing. And specifically, because all the infrastructure is done, the, the hard question here is how do we design this? How do we make sure that the router is designed or the routing is designed really well? So I'm going to let you all think about that for a moment. This show is made possible by the above average people who hire me for training and coaching purposes. Uh, typically organizations that have the capacity for the capability for a lot of business agility, they're typically smaller. Maybe there's two or 300 people in the development organization and, lot, and low bureaucracy. So they've got the ability for a lot of business agility, but they don't necessarily necessarily have the technical capacity. So they bring me in for agile engineering training and coaching uh, and uh, also consulting around process design, especially with relation to uh, how do you scale to multiple teams working together. If you'd like to participate in this and be one of these above average people, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. Visit my website, jameshore.com. I always welcome tweets from absolutely anybody at jameshore. Uh, however you contact me, I'm happy to set up a free consultation to talk about what we can do together. All right, let's get back to the challenge. We want to design the routing for our server and we want it to be really clean. How are we going to do that? Well. The technique that some people that we use is what some people call code whispering, and that's a little tongue in cheek. It's also called evolutionary design. And the key idea here is that, well, you're listening to your code. Rather than coming up with your design up front, you're listening to your code and seeing what the code tells you about where the design needs to go. And yeah, this does sound really woo woo, and it's actually kind of hard to explain, but I'm going to try to show it to you today. Now, don't forget point one here on the screen. Uh, you cannot do good design 
without knowing what good design is. I'm sorry, there's no magic technique that's going to teach you good design if you don't know it. The way to learn good design is to do a lot of design. Write a lot of code, uh, be critical about what works and what doesn't, read other people's codes, modify each other's code. I, good design, the essence of good design, I think, is how easy your code is to understand and modify. That say, don't don't assume that code's bad just because you don't understand it. Code's notoriously hard to read, so it's it's easy to assume that code is worse designed than it than it is when you're reading other people's code. A great source is Martin Fowler's Refactoring book. Uh, that is a one of the books that taught me the most about design. I, I highly highly recommend it, and it has been uh, come out with a second edition fairly recently, uh, just in the last year or two, uh, and it's very very good. So. You're going to be listening to your code. Well, what does that mean in practice? First, you're going to start out and you're going to have some initial ideas about where your design should go. And that's good. And if, you, you know, if you've got a good design sense, then you're going to do that. But just let them go. Let them sort of flutter off like butterflies <laughs> and say, that's very pretty. You go float over there. And then think, yes, I could do that. But I could do something else because something that happens when you're doing this evolutionary design technique is that you'll come up with ideas that you didn't expect if you listen to what the code is telling you. So listening to the code is just as you're working, notice when your code is getting ugly. And if it is ugly, then stop and think about it. And if you're doing test-driven development, it's red, green, refactor. That refactor step, that's a good time to stop and think. Sometimes you're going to come up with an idea that makes a lot of sense. You're going to do it right away. And sometimes you won't. And in that case, it's okay. Don't try to shoehorn in a questionable idea. Uh, you can experiment, you know, on another branch or something to try something. But typically, if you're not sure if it's a good idea, it's probably not a good idea. Just wait, let the code go a little longer, and come back to it. One of the surprising things about evolutionary design is how as you make little improvements, how it makes additional improvements appear that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. And the more room you leave in your code for these design ideas, rather than coming up with some big complicated design that sort of locks everything in place, the more room you leave for new ideas to come out, the more creative your design and more clever, more clever in a good way, the more interesting ideas you'll come up with. And, and it's for me, led to some really surprising designs that's better than anything I would have come up with uh, on my own to begin with. So that is uh, code whispering or evolutionary design. What we're going to be specifically doing today, as we're working, I want you to look for code that's doing too much. This is a really common problem. We're going to start out, we're not going to build any design in from the beginning, so we're going to get to the point where our code's doing too much. Look for cases where we've got lots of methods that are doing stuff that are related, but not related to the rest of the code. Or important code that can't be called directly. When we see that, that's a sign that that code should probably be extracted out into its own module or class. Similarly, look for tests that are overcomplicated. If they've got setup that's complicated and talks about stuff that's different than what the rest of the tests are talking about, or if we have clumps of tests that are related to each other but not the rest of the test, again, that's a sign that we've got multiple responsibilities in our code and we need to factor it out and extract it out. So that's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and get to the code. Again, if you'd like to follow along with today's uh, code, go to github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Check out the tag 2020-06-23. At the end of the show, I will upload the finished results with 2020-06-23-end. If you're following along, this is all written in Node.js. It's not really specific to JavaScript, but I had to choose a language. So you'll need to install Node.js, and then you can everything's vendored into the repo, so you can build the code by using build.sh or just build on Windows. And that will lint the code and run all the tests. If you want a quick build, and it's not going to run as quickly for you as it is for me because you're not running a streaming, you're not running streaming software. A uh, quick build will only build and test the things that have changed. Use the quick option, and then if you want to automatically build when files change, use the watch script, and that will also play a nice little sound when your tests succeed or fail. Uh, to run the tests, use run, or to run the code, use run. So that's how this works. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Lizard and welcome. We are doing a microservice. We're building a microservice from scratch, and we're doing the routing using a little technique called code whispering. You can find out more 
in the uh, repo up here. Okay, so here's our server, our tests, and our production code for this server. And you can see we've got some stuff that uh, does our command line and then the actual routing. We start the server here and we write that the server has been started and then whenever we get a request, we uh, write received request and then we return a little placeholder. What we need to do is have this do actual routing. We need to check the URL, the method, the headers. This is stuff that we talked about in previous weeks, but now we're going to actually do it. And of course, this is all going to be test driven. So let's start out by saying that We've got a test right here saying that we transform our requests. We have a status of 200 and a content type of text plane. Now that we're doing this for real, let's have it return actual JSON. So we'll say the content type is application JSON char set UTF-8. Uh, and uh, just to remind everybody, uh, your questions and comments are welcome. Just put them in the chat. Uh, I will take some of them as we go, and there'll be time at the end for more questions if needed. So we're going to change the content type to application JSON, but that's not what we're actually doing. So we just need to fix that. All right. And we want the body to be an actual JSON string as well. So let's say that we've got JSON stringify, and we'll say that the result should be a transformed, an object with transformed field. In it. That's what we're expecting. We're not getting that, so let's go ahead and fix that. Say json.stringify. Okay, easy peasy. Let's do the next thing. Let's do some actual routing. We're going to say that it returns not found when URL is incorrect. And we're going to have to do a lot of the same stuff here. So let's go ahead and copy this. And your design sense should be tingling right now because I just did a cut and paste. Whenever you do cut and paste code, that's a sign that you've got some duplication in your system that maybe shouldn't be there. Uh, that's true for your tests as well as your production code, although I do allow more duplication in my tests because it makes them easier to read. But in this case, I'm duplicating a lot of cruft that doesn't really matter. So we're going to create a request and we're going to say that the URL is no such URL. And for our real request, we better put in the right URL. So that's going to be, let's say, rot13 slash transform. And we're not going to care about seeing the standard out. So we can take this out. And we're going to expect the status to be 404, content type to be the same, and the output to be Let's say error not found. Okay, that's failing. We're getting a 200 and we're getting an actual transformation. So let's go back into here and we'll say if the ref request is not wrote 13 slash transform, we'll return not found. By the way, if you're wondering why, where this code came from, this was part of our programming by intention that we did in the last episode. And again, you can find that at jamesshore.com uh, slash blog slash lunch and learn. So we're going to write uh, not found. And this is going to return. It's going to return an object a lot like this. Except it's going to be a status of 404. Content type is right. And then the air not found. And again, your spidey sense should be tingling. We just duplicated and now we're in production code. So duplication is much worse than it is in tests. We've got a problem here, but let's get our test passing. Now, do we want to fix this problem yet? Um, I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm not sure exactly how I want to solve this. And also there's a saying from Martin Fowler, which I love, which is three strikes and then you refactor. So let's see one more piece of duplication. On the other hand, here in our test, we've got a lot of cruft, and I think it's making the test hard to write. So I would like to factor out, oh, let's, um, let's start by factoring out the simulate request part. So we've got this piece that we're doing everywhere. Let's make a new function called simulate request async. It's going to 
take something and do this stuff. And yeah, let's have that take a URL and default it to a valid URL so we don't have to be constantly putting this into every single test. And let's take a body and default that to somebody that we don't care about. And we'll start the server. We'll create the request with our URL and body. And then we'll return the response. And that's failing because I forgot my async. Now if I do that, I should be able to say response is equal to await simulate request async and then just the URL. And I don't care about the body because we're defining a body by default. We've got our default body here. So if I do that, I should be able to get rid of that. There we go. Okay, good. Now I'd like to do thing, the same thing here, but this test actually needs the command line. But as I look at it, I see that I think it's actually two tests. We're checking that we transform the request, but we're also checking that we log the request. So we can take this and we can split it apart into two. I'm going to do that by duplicating it and say that first we log the requests. And if we do that, we just need to simulate any random request. We don't care which one. And we don't care about the response. There we go. And then here, I don't care about the command line anymore. So I can take this simulate request async and do this. That's nice. Now I am passing in the valid URL and I don't have to because we're, we're providing it down here. But I think for documentation, I would like the happy path to actually include the valid URL. What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that out into a constant and I'm going to call that valid URL. Okay. Let's go ahead and do our next thing. We've got the not found. Let's take care of the method not allowed. So we're going to want to simulate a request with a method of git. Um, we'll need to pass the method through here. Well, let's make a valid method and we'll pass a valid method here as well. And again, we don't strictly need this, but I think it's nice for documentation reasons. That's going to fail. Oh, I thought that would fail. Oh, well, it hasn't failed because we don't actually have an assertion. So we're going to assert that the status is 405 and the error is method not allowed. Okay, and that's failing as expected. Let's take this and we'll duplicate this. And again, Spidey Sense should be tingling but we're going to get this test to pass before we address it. Okay, we expected method not allowed, but we're not getting it. Oh no, this is transforms request. Um, That should have worked. I'm not sure what's wrong here. So transforms request is failing. We're passing in a method. We're expecting to get the response back, but uh, we're not passing it through here. <laughs> there we go. 
Okay. So now looking at this, uh, now we've got our three strikes. I'm going to go ahead and refactor. We've got our response done over and over. And if we take this out and we call this status, and we take this out, we call it body. We do the thing, same thing here. Oops. And we do the same thing here. We end up with the exact same code. So we can now take this, extract it out into a method, and let's call that response. And we can even take this and call this response 200 and there. Although, I think we can clean this up a little bit further. This is the OK response. So let me take this and we'll call it OK. And here, we're going to need to do this. And uh, Jinder Ted has a comment. He says, uh, I love this refactoring, though in Java, I can extract method first and then introduce parameter for status body and, and so forth. Yeah, you can do that in, uh, in Java. But in JavaScript, because it's a dynamically typed language, the IDE is not always as capable, and I don't really trust it. So I tend to be pretty conservative in the automated refactorings I do. Uh, speaking of refactoring, I think we also could factor out an air response. So let's do that. Let's call this air. And air. And now this can become air response. And air response. And then we can move that here. And now we can inline all this stuff. Oh, you know what? For this air response, though, I want the status to be first. So let's do that. Okay, now we can inline that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. And that one. There, that's pretty nice. Okay, that cleans things up pretty well. Um, let's go back to our tests. I think we can do something similar in our tests. We're, we're asserting all over the place. Let's do this. Let's make a new function called assert response equals. We'll have it take a response and a status and a body. And we'll assert that the status and so forth looks like that. That's going to pass because we're not using it yet. But now we should be able to say assert response equals and then that. Excellent. We can do the same thing here for our not found. Oops. And the same thing here for our OK response. Remember, your tests are code too, and it's always a good idea to refactor them. Now, some duplication is OK, but only in your tests, but only if it makes the tests more clear. So it's always a good idea to come through and refactor out factor out anything that 
is just cruft that makes the test harder to understand. And I think this is, is really nice. It really gets at the heart of what we're doing here. We're saying that when the URL is no such URL, the response is a 404 with an error not found. Uh, I really like that. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is uh, the request headers. If we don't have the correct type of request, the correct content type, we're gonna say that it's a bad request. So we're gonna simulate a request with a particular set of headers and we're gonna expect an error invalid content type header. Those headers are gonna be, let's go with text plain. And down here we'll have to pass the headers through. And let's remember to pass them through here this time. <laughs> And we'll need our valid headers up here. And let's pass them through here just for the purpose of documentation. Okay, we've got a problem on line 47. Oh, I forgot to put parenthesis or quotes around that. Okay, we're seeing an error. We're getting it transformed. We expect it to be a content type header. That's great. So let's come back here. Return bad request. And actually let's pass in the error message because we'll probably have different kinds of bad requests later. So here we'll just say invalid content type header. And that should be saying we're getting a 405. That should have been 400. Uh, Jitter Ted asks, uh, isn't this premature flexibility here on the bad request? It is. And actually uh, in one of my my practice runs for today's episode, I did do it later. But the fact is, is we don't have a lot of time, so I'm, I'm not necessarily <laughs> doing it exactly the way I would for real. Um, sometimes I think, yeah, this is just the way it's going to be. Sometimes I think, well, I'm not so sure. It really depends on how confident I am in a particular design idea. And one of the tricks, of course, with evolutionary design is teaching yourself to be less confident in your design ideas. Um, that said, this one I think is pretty straightforward. Uh, Jitter Ted says, uh, totally fair and sometimes it's a judgment call. Absolutely. This is, design is all judgment. It's just pure judgment. There is no right or wrong answer with design. People will tell you this design is garbage. That's not true. Uh, there is no such thing as objectively bad design. There's only subjectively bad design. I think this design is bad. And I think the truest measure of whether a design is good or bad is how easy the code is to understand and change. So design is actually entirely in the eye of the beholder. If I'm a brilliant developer who knows all the latest functional programming stuff, and I come across a design that's beautiful and elegant and written with a lot of functional programming, that's good design for me. If I'm a new developer and I don't know all this stuff and I come across a design like that and I can't understand it and I can't modify it, it's bad design for me. So good design or bad design is all about who are you writing it for. And generally, you're writing it for not yourself. So think about that. All right, uh, let's continue on. So now we've got our, our uh, basic routing in place. I think this code is pretty clean, but there's something here that I notice. And I want you to take a look, moment here. What do you notice about this code? This has one of those method clumps I was talking about. We've got a whole bunch of meth code here, whole bunch of methods that uh, is all about 
creating the correct, correct response. So in my mind, that's a smell. That's a, that's a potential problem here in this design. Uh, and I think I'd like to take this out because that's, it seems like a separate responsibility. And there's this idea of the single responsibility principle. We want any class or module to be focused on a single responsibility. Seems like the responsibility of crafting a response is actually a separate responsibility. I'd like to move it out. Uh, Jitter Ted uh, says, uh, uh, basically agrees with what I was saying before about design quality. Uh, that, that's the hardest part of the code design, understanding who the audience is or might be. Absolutely. And it's something, it's not about being clever. It's about making code that's maintainable. And who's going to be reading the code? Uh, who's going to understand it? A lot of, a lot of sort of mid-level uh, programmers who seen a lot of design, maybe five to 10 years of experience, um, typically have a title of senior, but they're really just getting started on their senior development uh, skill set. They'll often try to create designs that magically handle everything for you. Uh, but that actually tends to lead to worse design because the people who are using that design now can't understand it because there's too much magic. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's go ahead and factor this out into another module just to take care of responsibility of creating the request or of creating the response. And because I like my top level to be really simple with, so you can easily see where to start when you're trying to understand the code, I'm going to put this in a subfolder and I'm going to call that routing. I'll make a new file for this new module we're about to extract. Now I don't need to write tests for it because our existing tests, because they're sociable, they'll just run through and they'll run those tests for us. I'm going to call this route 13 router. We can take our existing code and we can copy it in there. Now this is going to fail. Oh no, it isn't going to fail. Uh, I thought there would be some assertions that we'd need. So, or some, some requires that we'd need, but it looks like we don't. Uh, Uncle Scientist says, occasionally I come up with a design I think is good. I get 80% of the way coding it up, and then I realize I could have done it a much better way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then goes on to say, uh, but doubting my initial design wouldn't have helped because the poorly designed code helped me come up with a better way. Yeah, that's, that's really common for me too, Uncle Scientist. Uh, there's no perfect design. Every time you make a step forward, it sort of reveals new opportunities. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, what I do find, though, is that if I don't make big, complicated house of cards, it's easier to refactor as I learn new things. So I'm pretty reluctant to factor out big ide design ideas until I've seen a proven need for them. That said, it's not wrong. It's just maybe a little harder sometimes. Uh, Jitter Teta says, is this router? No, this is not router. This is response. <laughs> Thanks, Jitter Ted. Uh, no, that is meant to be just the response. Uh, let's go ahead and bring this out. So this is going to be, we're going to change the function to exports.function equals. And we'll place that and that, but that's helper. And we'll replace that. And then, oops, I did that wrong. Let's do that again. We're going to want function space to equal exports dot. There we go. And then we're going to want parenthesis to become equals function parenthesis. But not all of them, just that one, that one, that one, and that one. And then we're going to need our semicolons. Okay, now that we've done that, we can require this. And we can start using it. Good. So let's take this. We'll do not found. We'll do method not allowed. And bad request. Okay, now that I've done that, I shouldn't need this or this. And in fact, I should now be able to inline all of these. That one. There we go. Well, that's nice. 
Yeah, I like that. Now back in our test, this gives us the opportunity for something new. Now we don't need to do this complicated assert response equals because we're already taking care of that. Uh, well, we're gonna need to test it. So in fact, let's go ahead and take these tests and move them over to our response. We don't strictly have to, but I think that would be nice. So it will make the test easier to, to find and it will also make it so that they can be more focused. So let's make a new test called rot13 rot response test JS. And we'll bring in our assert. Uh, Jitter Ted says, uh, keep the test close to the implementation. I, I would generally agree with that, Jitter Ted. Okay, and let's go ahead and copy these tests over. So this is not going to work because there's all kinds of stuff here that's not going to apply, but we'll take it one piece at a time. First, we'll let our linter help us. It's complaining that simulate request async is not defined. Uh, yeah, I'll bring that over. But I'm going to just comment it out for now. And now it's complaining that our constants are not defined. And our assert response equals is not defined. And our root 13 is not defined. Okay. Uh, now we're getting some problems. So let's actually fix this. So we're going to want to simulate request async. Well, let's say that first, this is not transforming a request. All we care about is the OK response. So our response is actually just going to be a road 13 response dot OK with, you know, my response or my output, which means the response should equal 200 yes and transformed yes, but we don't need the road 13 transform. We just need it to be my output. So let's go ahead and grab Rote 13 response and require that. And we'll get rid of the async. And we'll need to make this route correctly or require correctly. There we go. That's better. Now I don't think we are actually going to need this Rote 13 since we're not actually asserting about the transformation. Let's deal with the not found case. Response again is just going to be wrote 13 response dot not found. Good. Method not allowed. And bad request. There we go. Uh, we got rid of all of our simulate requests, simulate requests, so let's take that out. And there we have it. Our tests have been moved down, and I think they're much nicer to read now. Uh, now it's really focused on what we're talking about. So this is an example of what I was talking about before, where our tests sometimes have complicated setup that's not really about the core of the problem. By factoring out this code, we've solved that. Now back here, we're still asserting that we've got this whole uh, object in our response, but we don't need to do that anymore because we can trust that our wrote 13 response works correctly. So instead what we can do is we can just say that our response equals response.badRequest. We'll just pass in the invalid content type he header. Mm -hmm. 
except that should be rote 13 response. And we'll need to bring it in up here. There we go. And we can do the same thing for our method not allowed. And are not found. And are OK. There we go. I think that's pretty nice. Now let's look for additional opportunities to refactor. We do have more work that we need to do. Uh, specifically, what we're going to need to do is we need to parse our JSON and make sure that it's correct. But as I look at this code, I see another one of those test clumps that we were talking about. Most of our tests are starting the server and then making assertions about sort of the nitty gritty of how the server works. But then we've got all of these tests here, which are all about what do we do with a specific request. That feels to me like another clump of behavior, another responsibility. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take that responsibility out of our server and into its own file, just like we did with Rote 13 response. In this case, I think what we want to do is take basically everything except for the command line write standard out and put it in another module, which I'm going to call a router. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, we don't have to make the tests, at least not right away, because our existing tests will just run this. So we need a router. And let's make the function here uh, route async. And that will need a request. And we'll take this and we'll just paste it in. Now this is going to need a bunch of requires that we don't have. Route 13 response. And wrote 13. There we go. And I'm going to add, go ahead and add our type checking, which I forgot to add before. I don't generally test my type checking. So now we'll need an HTTP request. And we'll need to get that right. Looks like we broke our quick build. There we go. And let's go ahead and do the type checking over here as well, just for consistency. There we go. Okay, so we have our router. We've copied the code over, but we're not using it yet. Should be able to just take it here, though, and say route13router.routeAsync request. And we'll return that result. I will need to get the router. Nice. So now we don't need any of that. In fact, I think we can clean this up a bit by taking this and putting in its own function. We'll need to pass self through. In order to do that, we'll have to bind it. Now I could just bind directly to self and then use this, but I always find that a little magical and confusing, so I don't do it that way. Okay, and now this run server async, we can just inline that. And there's our code, start async, we check the signature, we check the command lines, we parse the port, we start the server, and we write this as started. I, I really like the way that reads. I think that's nice. Okay, now we can do our, we can move our tests over. We've got all this routing tests that I think would be nicer if it was actually, as, as Jitter Ted said, closer to the implementation. So let's go ahead and 
make our router tests. Just occurred to me in our response tests, did we use the right describe? We did, because we named it the wrong thing for a little while, right? Okay, let's go back to our router tests. Uh, we've got those working. So now we can copy over our code. That's not gonna work at first, so let's go ahead and comment it out. And we'll just bring it in one piece at a time. Okay, we need our constants. So let's bring those over. We need simulate request async, which is not going to work at first. So I'll comment that out. And we need route 13. And route 13 response. And those will need to be in the right spot. Okay, so now we can do the actual test. Simulate request async is going to start the server. Well, we don't need to do that. It's going to create the request, and then it's going to simulate the request. Well, we don't need to simulate the request. We can just call our router right here, route async. So let's return route 13 router dot route async. And I think that's all we need other than to require the router. Let's see, it doesn't know what HTTP request is. So let's grab that. And we'll need to look in the right spot for it. Hey, there we go. So now we can transform requests, return not found, method not allowed, and bad request. Excellent. So here, we don't need most of these because they're already done. But I do want to test that the server actually uses the router. But I don't care about transforming the request, I just want to know that it routes the request. So let's go ahead and change the test to do that. And then I think we can simplify this. Don't think we need this assert response equals anymore. And this is only going to be used in this one test, so I think we can bring it in. So this is going to give us the response. And these are the things we're going to pass through into our request. There we go. But we actually, we can go a little further than that. This is, this is making an ex... Uh, expectation or specifying exactly how the router should respond. And in some cases that's valuable. Some cases you want your higher level test to check the output. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this more isolated. Uh, it's still going to be a sociable test and it's going to call the third party or the, the dependency. But I'm going to say that I don't care what the dependency returns as long as it returns something. So let's say that the expected response is going to be whatever the router gives us. For that request. There's a trade off here that you can make in either direction, you can either make your tests more robust against changes, or you can make them fail. Uh, more eagerly when the behavior changes in a very specific way. This will still fail if the router stops working entirely or if an exception is thrown, which does happen, but it will, it's more robust against uh, changes that we've tested within our router. Or presumably we've tested. <laughs> when you change the router, presumably you're gonna test it. Okay, so let's run that. Uh, it's complaining, I think, that we don't have the router.
And now it's complaining because we can't read the body twice, <laughs> which is something we implemented last week. So we'll need to make a second request and we'll pass that through here. Okay. But you know what? We don't care about the specific request that we're sending. We can just send any random request. And as long as the router routes in the way we ex that it should, then that's fine. So I'm just going to say any, any request will work. And then I can inline that and I can inline that. And let's say that this is the actual response and this is the expected response. There we go. So a lot of refactoring here, but uh, that is what evolutionary design is all about. It's noticing when your code is not as clean as it could be, coming up with a new design, and then refactoring to that design. And as I said, some people call that code whispering. It's listening to the code to figure out uh, what it is trying to tell you. So I think our server is looking pretty good right now. And Jitter Ted says, uh, noticing is so important. That is absolutely the key. You have to have a sense of good design. You have to notice when the design's not great. That's a skill that, you know, you just have to work on for years and years. I've been doing it. I've been working on that skill for decades and it's still, I've still got lots to learn. I'll be learning this for the rest of my life. Now we're almost to one o'clock and I do want to be done at one, but we're not quite done with the code. Uh, we've got the happy path case for our router. And I want to call that out. Okay, that was a little overkill. Let's bring this down like that. There we go. And we've got the bad routing case. But what we don't have yet is parsing. So it should uh, return bad request when uh, JSON fails to parse. So let's simulate a request. We'll say the body is not JSON. And when that happens, we expect a bad request with, I don't know, I'll probably just pass through the JSON error or the parse error. So let's come into here and say that when we read the body, we're actually getting a JSON string. We're going to want to turn that into our actual JSON. So we'll need to try to parse that JSON string. And if that fails, we're going to return a bad request with that error message. And then here we can say that the input is equal to the JSON. Oh, let's say that we want a field called text. Okay, so the error is going to be unexpected token O in JSON at position whatever. And then our happy path is failing now because it's expected, it's getting some unexpected values as well. We need to actually make this hello that we're passing through into a valid body. So let's do that. We'll say that the body is equal to text hello. And now we're still failing in the router uh, on line do, do, 68. We're getting an error when we call HTTP request.create null. It's expecting a string, but it's an object, right? Because we're passing an object through. So we'll just say that if the body is a string or is an object, we will stringify it. And let's go ahead and make our body a valid body. I always find that 
in your helper methods, have it do what's correct by default. Okay, there we go. And now let's say that it returns a bad request when JSON doesn't have text, uh, text field. So if our body is something like wrong field, then we're going to expect some sort of error out of this. Simulate the request for that body, and then the re response will be something. So we're getting an error again in route async, line 27. And that's our route 13. It's got uh, type checking on it saying we've got the wrong type. But we don't want to throw an exception. We want to return a response. So what we can do is we can use our, our type checker right here. We can say that the type of JSON should be the request type. Uh, this type checker is something that I just wrote many, many years ago that I've been using ever since. You can find lots of runtime type checkers on NPM. So we'll say the request type is an object with the field text, which is a string. Okay, and it's failing. It's saying variable.txt must be a string, but it was undefined. Let's actually have it say response.txt must be a string, but it was undefined. Perfect. Grab that. Put it in our code. And one more thing. Let's say that it, it's, it's really common in a microservice to, to be fairly flexible at what you take. So we can say that it ignores extraneous field. That will give us a little bit of forward and backwards compatibility, sort of. So we'll grab that and we'll have the wrong field, but we'll also have the right field. And we'll expect the response to be okay with the transformation of right field. And that is failing. Response had unexpected parameter, but we can fix that because my little type checker can say, hey, at least this type. And there we go. That is our parsing, our routing, and our happy path. I think that's done. I really do. Uh, let's <laughs> now demo gods frown on me for saying this, but generally speaking, when you're doing sociable tests and test driven development, once your tests pass, it just works. So let's see if this just works. We're going to say HTTP get uh, port 5000. Well, let's run it. We'll run this on port 5000. We'll say, give me port 5000, and this should give us uh, not found error. And there we go, not found. Excellent. Let's put in the correct uh, URL. It should give us a method not allowed error. Method not allowed, very good. Let's uh, use the right kind of method. Now it should complain that we've got uh, the wrong type of uh, content type. Yes, invalid content type. Excellent. Set the content type to application JSON. Now it doesn't like our JSON. That's good. Uh, let's say foo equals bar. Now it's going to complain we don't have a text. Response.txt must be a string, but it was undefined. Very good. Let's do it correctly. Text hello world. And there we go. There's our transform text. Works the first time, pretty much every time. And that is the end of today's session. I just got barely under the wire. Uh, I do have time for additional questions, though, if uh, anybody wants to ask them. Go ahead and think about that for a moment. And uh, while you're thinking about that, a couple of reminders about uh, what's coming up soon. Uh, next week's session, we are now done with the Microservices Without Mock series. So, woohoo! Um, so next time we're gonna go on back to something I think a little bit simpler, a little more straightforward. We're gonna do uh, just some basic test-driven development. 
And I'm, what I'm thinking is that right now our our content type, which is application JSON, that could actually have a char set and it could have a variety of things. So our exercise next time is gonna be some parsing logic for our content type. Uh, and it's gonna be really small and focused. So if you've got people who you think might have been interested in this series, but the microservice stuff wasn't a great place to join, have them join us next week. Uh, we'll do just sort of basic test-driven development, incremental test-driven development again. That is next week, noon Pacific, June 30th. So I hope to see you. And then also a quick reminder, if you liked what you saw today and you'd like to have me come in and work with your teams directly on uh, your language, your libraries, your frameworks, uh, often in your actual code base, if that's what you want, uh, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jamesshore.com. Very happy to talk to you about what we can do together. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, questions show up and it is one o'clock, uh, so that is our time. Thanks very much. Uh, that is the end of our series. Again, if you'd like to see the previous episodes uh, in this series, check out the archive, jamesshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn. And we will be back next week, June 30th, to do some parsing logic. Thanks very much, everybody. I will see you all next week.